the, the feed from the speaker. Um, and just to let people tab, um, who, who I met probably maybe a year ago or so on um, on Twitter, there's there's quite a nice little group of kind of uh, philosophy of psychiatry uh, Twitter folk, um, Dr. Aftab being one of them, and he's, he's very kindly uh, agreed to, to speak to us today. And um, so I'll, I'll just tell you a little bit um, about him, although it won't let me minimize my screen when I'm recording. Here we go. So um, Dr. Aftab is a clinical assistant professor of psychiatry at Case Western Reserve University. Uh, Cleveland, Ohio, USA. I think he's our, our first international speaker, so welcome. Um, also a staff psychi psychiatrist at Ohio Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services. Um, he's a member of the Executive Council of Association for the Advancement of Philosophy and Psychiatry, uh, and has been actively involved in initiatives to educate psychiatrists and trainees on the intersection of philosophy and psychiatry. Um, he leads a fantastic uh, interview series called Conversations in Critical Psychiatry, uh, which is for the Psychiatric Times. And the, the, the link was, was sent around with the email, um, and that explores the, the critical and philosophical perspectives in psychiatry, um, engaging with prominent commentators, both within and outside the profession, who have uh, meaningful criticisms of, of the status quo. Um, and I, I'd certainly strongly recommend um, checking that out. Um, so today's talk will, will focus on the interplay of facts and value judgment formalized in the philosophical positions of naturalism and normativism. So we're going to examine how facts and judgments play a role in the ascription of psychopathology uh, and how normative considerations shape concepts of disorder in clinical practice. And um, so without further ado, I'm going to double check we're recording, which we are and I'll hand over to Dr. Aftab. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Chris. Uh, very uh, glad and excited to be presenting to this group. Um, so let me share my screen. Um, okay. All right. Let's start the presentation. Okay. Uh, everyone can see the, uh, the presentation. Um, yeah, answer? that's great. All right. That's good. Thank you. So um, uh, thank you for the int introduction. Uh, this kind of like just summarizes what, what Chris was just uh, mentioning that, that the focus of the talk today is kind of sort of like on, uh, on the interplay of facts and values, kind of like particularly sort of like how do they sort of like come up, how they become relevant and how we sort of like, you know, engage with these sorts of considerations uh, when it comes to the concept of mental disorder, particularly uh, the manner in which the concept of mental disorder uh, exists in our clinical pr practice and in our, in our clinical work. Um, so we're gonna sort of like, you know, take a conceptual look at, at, at these assumptions that we often don't think of quite, quite a bit. Um, one thing I would say is that uh, for, for some reason, in, initially when um, when I sort of like when I was preparing for this talk, I, I thought that this was going to be like a 90 minute presentation, but then I found out this you know it was going to be a 60 minute presentation and then some time for Q and A. So so as a result, I I shortened some sections of the talk that that normally sort of like go along with this, but uh, but it, this is still sort of like you know this still is a self contained. It should make sense and uh, and hopefully if there are any sort of like, you know, things that are not clear, uh, we'll, we'll be able to discuss them during the Q&A session. Um, another thing I want to sort of like say before I jump into the talk is that uh, like in my, my purpose is, is just to introduce you to these ideas and introduce you to the, to the debate. Uh, I don't want to sort of like convey the, the impression that, uh, that there, so there's, the, you know, that the debate is settled, that we have right answers about what is going on. Uh, this is like a very complicated and complex topic, and there are certainly no easy answers here. There, there's plenty of room for reasonable disagreement. So I'm, I'm uh, kind of exploring sort of like this area a little bit, and I'm presenting it from my perspective, and I'm trying to sort of like make clear what the debate is really about. And I sort of like present some answers, which I, which I think uh, tend to make a little bit of sense, but, but I'm certainly making no claim that, that the debate is settled. There, there's just one right answer uh, th that I'm gonna present uh, here. Okay, uh, 
So uh, this uh, uh, kind of like sh this slide shows the outline of sort of like, you know, what, what are we going to do over the next 60 minutes? So uh, I'll begin by talking about some basic concepts that, that are relevant to this debate, uh, which will be essential for us to understand uh, in order to sort of like, you know, to make progress, make sense of things. Then we're going to talk about kind of like this uh, uh, the sort of like the, the, the figure with a very troubled legacy, uh, Thomas Zaz. Um, we'll talk about his ideas and particularly sort of like, you know, some of the central ideas that continue to play a role in, in, in this debate. Uh, we'll take a look at the DSM and the kind of like the notion of uh, disorder that exists, mental disorder that exists in the DSM. Uh, we'll take a look at sort of like the idea of uh, biological dysfunction and whether that can settle the debate or not. And then we'll kind of like, you know, we'll take a brief look at like what happens, like what sort of picture of psychiatry emerges if we give up the idea that, uh, if we give up the idea of naturalism. And I'll just, I'll just uh, tell you what, what, uh, what I mean by that. Uh, another thing I want to say is that as I, as I was preparing this talk, I, um, uh, I sort of like I was mindful of the fact that not everyone may have had prior exposure to these debates and these concepts. So I've tried to keep things very simple uh, uh, for that purpose. So, so hopefully even people who have never heard about this topic, topic before or never thought about it, they'll, they'll still be able to follow. Okay. So um, th this is a quote by Robert Spitzer, who's, who's one of the most uh, influential psychiatrists of uh, 20th century um, for, for sort of like for a big reason as he was the architect of, of DSM-3 uh, uh, and kind of like started off this, this movement of uh, uh, a descriptive operationalized criteria. And uh, one of the great things is that Robert Spitzer has been, uh, you know, in addition to his psychiatric work with the DSM, uh, he had been pretty open regarding his own conceptual thought process and what was going on. So, so uh, we are fortunate to sort of like have this secondary uh, uh, sort of like body of literature that gives us insight into what sort of like Spitzer was thinking and how his own thought process changed uh, over the over the course of his career. Uh, so. So this is a this is a quote from uh, from one of his articles, and and he says physicians, including psychiatrists, give a lot of thought in their everyday work to answer the question of whether or not a particular patient has a disorder. They rarely give much thought to the broader issue of what constitutes a disorder, and and I feel like this kind of like you know he he really uh, identifies something very pertinent here is that as clinicians, you know, in in our day to day work. Uh, we're not really concerned with this larger abstract concept of question of like what is a disorder. We are, we are sort of like you know we're more concerned with the with the patient in front of us. You know we're sort of like concerned with the specific tasks. We're trying to make a specific diagnosis, and we don't really think much about sort of like you know like what is this entity called disorder or disease uh, by by itself. So. Um, asking these questions kind of like, you know, requires us to take a little step back and, and look at the larger picture. Uh, and that's, that's what we're going to do um, in this lecture today. Um, something I'm not going to talk about in, in, in detail here is this idea of uh, conceptual competence. And this kind of like, this relates to what uh, Spitzer was saying as well about the need to kind of take a step back and look at the larger, uh, sort of the larger picture and, uh, and the sort of like philosophical concepts is that uh, I've been part of a, a sort of like small movement uh, of encouraging uh, uh, psychiatric training and psychiatric education to incorporate elements of, of philosophy of psychiatry so that uh, all of us uh, as practicing clinicians, as practicing psychiatrists, as researchers can be better informed and have better uh, conceptual clarity. So we use the term conceptual competence for that. And, uh, and what we're doing today, I see that as being a part of this idea of conceptual competence. Okay, so this is a uh, this is a very uh, this is one of my favorite quotes by the philosopher Bertrand Russell, and I, I think it's, it kind of like sets the stage for what what might happen next for for a lot of people. So he he writes, everything is vague to a degree you do not realize till you have tried to make it precise, and everything precise is so remote from everything that we normally think that you cannot for a moment suppose that is what we really mean when we say what we think. 
what what Russell is kind of like, you know, trying to convey here is the idea that our everyday concepts have sort of like fuzzy boundaries. They're kind of like inherently vague. And that's something we don't really realize until we take a hard look at it and until, until we try to make it precise. But when we do that, and when we do make that concept precise, there's almost a sense of alienation. Then you know that precisely articulated concept seems kind of different from from sort of like you know the vague undefined concept that that we were working with before. So there's this sort of like the sense of disconnection, this sense of alienation that by making a, a vague concept more precise. You know, we, it's sort of like it generates the sense of confusion. Like, you know, is that what we really meant when we when we had left it vague and when we had left that undefined? And I think a similar sort of thing happens when we when we take a concept like mental disorder that is like so prevalent and sort of like you know gets used all the time, but is is inherently vague. And when we try to make it precise, when we try to pin down exactly what it is that we mean by mental disorder, you know, the end result that comes out often sort of like you know has that feeling of alienation to it you know is that what we really meant you know and so uh, you know so you might experience some of that if you've never thought about this issue before if you've never tried to make the concept of mental disorder uh, more precise you may experience this sort of alienation as we as we go about this task um, another thing I want to clear is that I mean, another thing I want to make clear is that uh, people sometimes talk about two levels of classification, where level one is this question of is this condition before us in the class of mental disorders or not, and with level two being how do we classify conditions within the class of mental disorders. Uh, for our purposes, we're we're largely going to be restricted to level one here, when we're, we're talking about the class of mental disorders itself and what falls within that class and what doesn't, and we are less concerned about sort of like how are we drawing boundaries within that class uh, itself. Although these two these two questions are quite related and and they're, and they're uh, you know like one has bearing on the other, but they're they are distinct to a certain degree, and for the most part, we're restricting ourselves to uh, to level one. So, so the central questions that, that occupy us is, what does it mean to say that a condition is a mental disorder? What are the criteria by which we determine whether something is or is not a mental disorder? And if you think about it, and sort of like, you know, and, uh, you know, as you're reading these questions, you, you might have some, uh, some answers that uh, that come to your mind, sort of like, you know, as to what you think are the, are the responses. Uh, and sort of like, you know, and so I, I've asked these questions to a lot of people uh, over the course of my training, as well as over the course of being a psychiatrist. And, uh, and also, so I've read a lot of literature on this. And sort of like my own sense is that, you know, sort of like we can kind of cluster these responses um, in, in certain sort of like broad categories. So, so one set of responses you tend to get they deal with things about distress, about, about suffering, you know, negative impact on life, uh, functional impairment, disability, dangerousness, you know, sort of like this sort of like forms like one cluster. Then we, then we have another that kind of like talks about violating social norms, the condition being undesirable in, in some way. Uh, there's another cluster of responses that tends to talk about breakdown of rationality or lack of meaningful connections between thought processes or behaviors. And then there's another cluster which talks about sort of like, you know, and, and obviously these, these are all vague terms themselves is abnormality or malfunction or dysfunction. Uh, you have lesion, pathology, uh, broken parts, sort of like, you know, like it's something broken in the brain something going wrong in some sort of like, you know, inherently vague, fuzzy sense. And, and then there's another thing that I've kind of loosely classified as the same, but, you know, is, is relatively distinct in some way is idea of statistical deviation, that the thing deviates, but not in the sense that it is like, not in the sense of social deviation, but in the sense that it's just like, you know, if you were to plot it on a uh, sort of like, you know, distribution curve, it'll be like, let's say two standard deviations or three standard deviations uh, away from, from, from the norm. So broadly, the, the terms that are, that are used in literature uh, for these various clusters are kind of like, so people use the term harm 
to represent the first cluster that deals with distress, suffering, functional impairment, disability. And most of the time when people are talking about harm, they're talking about harm to self, sort of like, you know, harm for the person who is experiencing that condition. But often left implicit and sometimes made explicit is this idea of harm to others, which is captured by this idea notion of dangerousness. Uh, that also plays a part. Um, it, it's not always made uh, explicit, so it, it can be difficult to analyze, but it kind of lurks there in, in, in the background, even if they're just talking about harm to the individual. And then there's sort of like, you know, the other idea is this social deviance. And this is sort of like where harm to others kind of like, you know, it's hard to differentiate where harm to others might end and where social deviance begins. Cause uh, a lot of times sort of like the social norms that are being violated kind of like relate to dangerousness in some way or, or risk in some way. Then sort of like we have this other, the other uh, uh, cluster, uh, we, we can call it irrationality. And then the, the broad cluster, it's, uh, it kind of like goes by, by the term of dysfunction. Now, one thing I want to make clear is that when, when I'm using the word dysfunction here and, and the way it's generally used in the philosophical literature, uh, we mean something like, like a malfunction, something going wrong. Uh, this is distinct from the sense of functional impairment. And this is important to clarify because sometimes in clinical work, we do use dysfunction to mean functional impairment, but that's not what we're, what, uh, uh, that's not what you're trying to do here. We're using it in a very different sense. So functional impairment sort of like would fall under this category of harm while dysfunction, you know, uh, we're talking about sort of like something going wrong, something going abnormal in, in some sense that we want to clarify. So from, from a philosophical perspective, and we're looking at disease concepts, we're looking at disorder concepts, uh, we tend to have either like empirical or fact-based judgments, you know, and these tend to relate about sort of like deviation or abnormality. And then we tend to have these normative or value-based judgments about human behavior, that the condition in question is harmful or undesirable in, in some way. Now, this by itself, you know, people have challenged that, you know, whether this, uh, this distinction is coherent, whether it makes sense or not. But as a starting point, we can sort of like, you know, we can take that, that, you know, some judgments are based on considerations of fact, and some judgments are based on considerations of value or, or sort of like various sorts of normative consideration. So the, the position of naturalism or objectivism kind of holds the view that there are objective natural facts about the human body and mind on which the notion of disease or disorder is based. And that categories of biological function and dysfunction exist independent of human values. And, you know, they can interact to sort of like, you know, generate more com complex judgments such as need for treatment. But essentially, you know, as a category, uh, function and dysfunction exist independently regardless of what we think about it, regardless of how we make sense of it. And that when it comes to disputed cases, if we have a clear grasp of facts, if we have access to all the facts, then, then we can decide, we can sort of like resolve the disputed cases. So disputed cases of sort of like of classification, dispute, disputed cases of uh, disorder designation are really disputed cases about what the facts are. Versus sort of like there's normativism or constructivism, which kind of sort of like says that the distinction between disease and dysfunction or disorder is constructed by human norms and values. And that simple reliance on facts is an illusion. And from, from this perspective, you know, disputed cases reveal conflict of values rather than ignorance of facts. And even when everyone agrees, you know, everyone sort of like agrees that this is a disorder and everyone agrees that this is not a disorder. That agreement can happen because of a universal acceptance of a system of values rather than the presence of objective facts. So it kind of like takes a bit of an opposing position where it sees the human norms and values as, as the driving force for this dividing line between normal, abnormal, uh, between kind of like normal functioning and, and, and dysfunction and that. Uh, there is some people here, I, for, for instance, uh, you know, Chris, I imagine, you know, uh, there's a related philosophical debate that that deals with essentialism, natural kinds, practical kinds, and, and social kinds. 
And I just want to clear that in, in case people are aware of that philosophical debate, that's not what I'm trying to get into right now. Uh, the debate about essentialism, or the debate about natural kinds is, is a separate topic. So even though this is really, this might be related to that and might resemble it in some ways, uh, we're not really talking about essentialism. Uh, we're not talking about natural kinds. Uh, we're talking about sort of like the boundary between uh, natural and abnormal, between normal and dysfunctional, and, and the role that facts and values play in, in, in that boundary. Um, and it is a distinct debate from the debate about essentialism and nominalism. Okay, so let me give you and sort of like, let me illustrate this by, by an example. So we all kind of remember the, the controversy uh, surrounding uh, the classification of Pluto, whether, whether Pluto uh, is, is a planet or not. And, and this kind of like arose historically uh, because when uh, Pluto was first discovered, um, it was uh, like its size and its its mass was estimated to be much more than what it turned out to be. So it turned out to be sort of like much smaller than people originally thought it. It turned out to have other sort of like unusual features such as a, as, as a tilted orbit. And then we found that there are actually a large number of bodies in the solar system that are approximately of similar size and, and mass as Pluto. So we had Ceres, we had Eris, and uh, so this kind of like produced a kind of like a confusion and, and a debate sort of like, you know, uh, like how do we really classify Pluto? Is it, is it a planet or not? And the interesting thing is that prior to that, prior to that debate, there was no official definition of planet. Like no one had defined what a planet was. So even though people have been talking about planets for, for you know, centuries, right, even longer than that, and people have been classifying uh, uh, sort of like celestial bodies as planets, there had never been a definition produced. And this kind of like shows that we don't really, we often tend not to think about definitions unless some kind of a conflict, unless some kind of a challenge comes up. And when some kind of a disputed case comes up and that's when we try to sort of like get clarity about uh, you know, what, how to define the concept. So concepts tend to be left undefined until some kind of an issue or, or, or a problem comes up. So what the International Astronomical Union uh, sort of like decided in, in 2006 was that a planet is a celestial body, which one is, is, is in orbit around the sun, two has sufficient mass to assume hydrostatic equilibrium, which basically means that a, it has a nearly round shape. And three, the user term, it has cleared the neighborhood around its orbit, which kind of like means that within its orbital path, it is the gravitationally dominant body. Now, uh, Pluto sort of like met the criteria for one and two, but it didn't meet the criteria for number three. So it, it, is, not the, it is not the gravitationally dominant body in its orbit, and it has not cleared it, it, its neighborhood uh, of sort of like, you know, other uh, various sorts of uh, uh, sort of like, you know, celestial bodies, you can say. So it sort of like, you know, it didn't meet criteria number three. So it, it didn't, it was sort of like disqualified uh, from the, uh, from the concept of planet and got demoted to the, to the concept of dwarf planet. The, the relevant thing for, for our sort of like consideration is that all of these criteria sort of like, you know, the, the three criteria that, uh, that are sort of like present here, like none of them refers to some kind of human interests or human values. They are essentially sort of like criteria about things that are like out there. So like essentially, if you had all the information about, uh, you know, celestial bodies in the solar system, sort of like, you know, uh, you know, what size they have, what gravitational properties they have, what sort of, you know, uh, movements they have, then you can look at this definition and you can sort of like, you know, decide whether sort of like, you know, um, whether that def criteria is, is sort of like met or not. Uh, we're not sort of like, you know, in using these criteria, uh, we're not having to rely on sort of like, you know, things such as human values in, in that. So let me present sort of like a, a, a different contrast. And these sort of like, these are categories that are inherently determined by, by human interest. So, so things such as like a weed, the, a plant that is considered undesirable in a, in a particular place or situation or, or pest, which is a plant or an animal that is detrimental to humans or human concerns, uh, including crops, livestock, forestry, uh, or vermin, which are sort of like defined as nuisance animals uh, that spread disease or destroy crops. Uh, 
Now, these, these concepts, they are defined in relationship to human interests and human activities. They, they have no objective or natural significance aside from the interests sort of like, you know, that, uh, that we're projecting on them. Uh, a, a weed fest vermin in one context is not a weed fest vermin in a different context. So this is, this is sort of like, this is a boundary. This is sort of like a category that is inherently sort of like defined with reference to human interest rather than with reference to things that, you know, might exist in, in, in nature independent of our, our own concerns. So the, you know, a simplistic way of thinking about this debate can be like, is mental disorder the concept? Is it more like a planet that it is in defined in terms of natural facts? Or is it more like we that is inherently defined in terms of human interest? And I, th I think as, as, as scientists, as, as medical clinicians, I think our our desire and inclination might be that you know mental disorder could be defined like a like a planet, something defined in terms of natural facts. But one thing I want to present to you in in, in this presentation is that it, it may be more like a weed that it may turn out that it is inherently defined in terms of human interests. Uh, so this is something sort of like you know we we have to think a little bit more uh, rigorously about. Um, this is just an, uh, an onion, uh, sort of like funny onion story. Uh, Gates Foundation pledges 25 billion to eradicate whatever disease drives people to support uh, taxing the rich. I think it just kind of humorously illust illustrates that point about human interests. All right. Now, this diagram, uh, you know, this figure might look a little bit complicated, but, you know, it, uh, I, I'll, I'll walk you through it. Uh, so, you know, and this kind of like represents the three different positions uh, in this naturalism norm normativism debate, you know. So on the top, sort of like you have simple naturalism, and the idea is that uh, all you need is that you have some sort of like factually defined dysfunction, you know, something like you know like a stroke or something like you know like a tumor, some some kind of pathological abnormality that can be like pathologically objectively defined. And as long as you have that objectively defined kind of like dysfunction in a system present, you know, that's all you need. That's a disorder, you know, that's a disease. Uh, versus, you know, uh, um, you have this idea of like hybrid naturalism or two-step naturalism where, yes, we need to begin with sort of like dysfunction. We need to identify uh, sort of like some kind of like, you know, objective pathology, some kind of like, you know, objective, objective malfunction. But in addition to that, we also need some kind of harm. You know, we need some kind of distress, impairment or disability. So, you know, only if the dysfunction produces distress, impairment, disability, then we, then we have a disease or then we have a disorder. So this is kind of like a hybrid naturalism or two-step naturalism as it combines both these, uh, both these criteria. And then you have normativism and normative uh, normativism challenges the very idea that there is something, so, some such thing as an objective, objectively defined uh, dysfunction. From a normative standpoint, all you have are different sorts of biological and psychological processes. And it so happens that some of these biological and psychological processes produce distress, impairment, disability or harm. And when they do so, we call them a disease or we call them a disorder, but there is nothing inherent to these different biological or psychological processes that give this category a sort of like a philosophical coherence or, or sort of like define what they are. We end up having to rely on distress, impairment, disability as the defining criterion because these are otherwise very heterogeneous sort of like processes that, that don't really have much in common. So these are kind of like, you know, the, the, the basic concepts. So let's kind of like jump into, uh, into Thomas Saz, um, who is uh, well known uh, for his 1960 book, uh, The Myth of Mental Illness, um, and uh, is historically recognized as one of the uh, leading so-called anti-psychiatry figures, at least in the US. Um, uh, he was a psychiatrist himself, and, uh, uh, but he's remembered as being one of the arch enemies of, of psychiatry. Um, um, I think uh, I'm, I'm not sure sort of like how familiar people uh, would be with his ideas uh, these days, but, uh, but references to his work are uh, sort of like very common in these philosophical discussions. And it's very hard to sort of like, you know, 
uh, go anywhere in these debates without tackling uh, uh, Zaz's ideas in, in, in some way. So, so for Zaz, you know, his view was that diseases are demonstrable anatomical or physiological lesions. So immediately, if you remember the last slide, you can tell that Zaz is a, is a sort of simple naturalist where he's kind of like talking about, you know, anatomical or physiological lesions. And if you have these lesions that are present, then like that said, that that's disease for you, although that's a disorder for you. So Zaz says that, you know, if that is true, you know, if we accept that diseases are demonstrable anatomical or physiological lesions, then the only sort of disease that can exist is physical. Mental disorders cannot be diseases in the literal physical sense because like the disease has to be physical, the mind is not non-physical. So how can the mind be diseased? You know, uh, that's kind of like, it's, it's the sort of like logical analytic argument that he says. So he says that if diseases can only be physical and the mind is not physical, then the mind cannot be diseased. So the mind can be diseased only in, in a metaphorical sense. So he says mental illness is a metaphor. Minds can be sick only in the sense that jokes are sick or economies are sick. So that's why he calls it a myth. He says he think, thinks, you know, mental illness is a myth or metaphor because mind cannot be diseased at all as disease is a physiological, physical lesion. So he, he writes, uh, the assumption is made that some neurological defect, perhaps a very subtle one, will ultimately be found for all the disorders of thinking and behavior. Many contemporary psychiatrists, physicians, and other scientists hold this view. I have tried to show that for those who regard mental symptoms as signs of brain disease, the concept of mental illness is unnecessary and misleading. For what they mean is that people so labeled suffer from diseases of the brain. And if that is what they mean, it would seem better for the sake of clarity to say that and not something else. So basically what Saad is saying is that, you know, a lot of psychiatrists around me, they think that the conditions we call mental illnesses, the conditions we call mental disorders, they are really caused by some sort of neurological defect that we just haven't discovered yet. And Saad says that if you really believe that, if you really believe that uh, these conditions are caused by neurological defects, then these are brain disorders. These are neurological disorders. And if that is what you mean, then call them what they are, you know, call them brain disorders, call them brain diseases, call them neurological diseases. You know, what, why are you calling them mental illness? Why are you calling them mental disorder? That the concept is misleading for your purpose, you know? So he's saying that if that is what you mean, if what you mean is that there is some kind of a subtle neurological defect, then why do you need to create this category of, of mental disorder, mental illness? And so let me illustrate this thing a little bit more uh, through, through, the, through this diagram. Um, let's see if, uh, if, the, if I can make the... Um, all right, so um, can you see this pointer? Uh, Chris, can, Chris, can you see this, the red pointer? Yes, we can, yeah. Okay, good. So, you know, so for, for, for SARS, you know, sort of like disease is something, some sort of, some sort of like a, a physical abnormality, something that is, is in the brain. So if you're having uh, behavioral and psychological problems and you have some kind of a disease process in the brain here, then he says that's a brain disorder, that's a, that's a brain disease, you know, like problem solved. And the other scenario is that you have some kind of a behavioral or psychological problem, but there's nothing like no abnorm abnormal process in the brain. There's no brain disease. So Zaz calls it problems in living. He says you have some kind of a behavioral psychological problem, but there's no brain disease, no physical disease. So that's a problem in living. So Zaz says this central thing that, you know, there's some kind of a disease in the mind. He says that's an incoherent notion. He says that doesn't make sense because disease is a physical concept, applies only to physical things. And if the mind is non-physical, you can't talk about the mind being diseased. So, you know, this central notion of mental disorder is incoherent for, for Zaz. Zaz says that either you have a brain disorder or you have behavioral problems, problems in living. There's no sort of like this middle thing of, uh, of, of sort of like, you know, mental disorders, mental illness. So, you know, 
now in 1960, you know, from Zazu's understanding, you know, there was no, not much evidence for, for any kind of like brain dysfunction or anything. So most of the condition he thought were problems in living. And he thought that if, if, if it does turn out that you find some kind of a neurological cause, then these conditions would become brain disorder. You know, like he said, you know, it's kind of this, this polarity. And the interesting thing is that a lot of contemporary biological psychiatrists they, they still think in these terms, you know, they still kind of like operate within this sort of like Zazian framework where, you know, mental, can, can, mental disorders in order to be real have to be brain disorders that, you know, if a mental disorder exists, then it only exists in the form of some kind of a neurological brain dysfunction. Otherwise, it's not a, it's not a disorder at all. So that's a curious sort of like similarity that even though there are radically different positions, like Zaz is operating in a very different sort of way than, than biological psychiatrists, but they seem to sort of like share a sort of like this idea that in order for a disease to be real, you know, it has to be a brain disorder or brain dysfunction in, in, in some manner. All right, so you know, uh, just to let you elaborating on that, Zaz says that if mental disorders are not brain diseases, then there are problems in living, human conflicts, unwanted behaviors. Psychiatrists are not concerned with mental illnesses and their treatments. In actual practice, they deal with personal, social, and ethical problems in in, in living. And and this is the point that that I just sort of like brought up. And this is Dominic Murphy. He's a he's a philosopher of psychiatry in Australia, and he he makes the same point. He says. This is a sense, though nobody likes to mention it, in which the medical model in psychiatry represents the vindication of Thomas Saz, whose skepticism about mental illness has always been predicated on the idea that to be a genuine illness, a psychiatric condition must be a physical disease or religion, a brain problem. And this whole problem emerges because of this notion of disease that we're using, if we begin with the point of view that disease has to be a physical lesion, then we end up with this conceptual dichotomy. It doesn't matter whether you're a Zaz, it doesn't matter whether you're a biological psychiatrist, you know, if the problem is that starting point, that starting definition, that disease concept or disorder concepts have to be defined in terms of physical abnormality. So let's take a look at, uh, at, the, at the DSM. Um, you know, so, you know, in the, in the 60s and 70s, sort of like there was like a lot of controversy going on. You had the anti-psychiatry movement with figures such as Zaz, Foucault, R.D. Ling. You had the homosexuality debate going on with, uh, with, the homo, uh, with sort of like the gay community protesting that, uh, uh, that they should not be diagnosed and treated as mentally ill. And all of that led to the need to define mental disorder, just kind of like in the same way as the Pluto crisis for, for the first time forced the astronomical community to define planet. So I'm, I'm sort of like, you know, at that time, Spitzer came up with a DSM-3 definition. I'm sort of like, you know, I'm talking about a DSM-5 definition, which still has kind of like broadly similar to what, what the DSM-3 definition was. So according to DSM, uh, you know, mental disorder is a syndrome characterized by clinically significant disturbance in an individual's cognition, emotion regulation, or behavior that reflects a dysfunction in the psychological, biological, or developmental processes underlying mental functioning. Mental disorders are usually associated with significant distress uh, or disability. Now you can sort of like see that it's sort of like, you know, making references to some of those initial terms that, that we discussed. So it's talking about a dysfunction. So this idea of, you know, something, the psychology or the brain going wrong in some way, but it doesn't really elaborate any further. So it makes a reference to dysfunction, but it leaves it undefined. And then it talks about distress and disability. So it's also kind of like making uh, sort of like reference to this notion uh, of, of harm. And it kind of like further elaborates that uh, it's not intended to be an expectable or, uh, or a culturally approved response to a common stressor, such as death of a loved one. And it also says that socially deviant behavior is not intended to be a disorder unless it says, unless the deviance or conflict results from a dysfunction in the individual. So you can see that the, the way DSM defines it, dysfunction is playing some kind of a crucial role where dysfunction is supposed to provide this demarcation between social deviance and mental disorder. 
but it doesn't really ex since it doesn't define this function it kind of like leaves it really vague you know sort of like like how are we supposed to do that if we don't know what this function is so it's kind of like relying on this folk psychological notion of this function without explicitly defining it in contrast if you look at icd icd sort of like takes a very minimal approach to this where it says it's a clinically recognizable set of symptoms associated in most cases with distress or with interference in personal function, it, it makes no reference to dysfunction at all. And, you know, and the thing is that, you know, because I DSM doesn't define dysfunction in practice, it ends up relying on, on distress and disability to do most of the work. So even though the, the definitions may look very different because DSM talks about dysfunction as a central thing, ICD doesn't even mention dysfunction, it talks about distress uh, disability, but in practice, the DSM definition collapses into the, into the ICD definition uh, because of the ambiguity surrounding dysfunction. So DSM-5 writes, in the absence of clear biological markers or clinically useful measurements of severity for many mental disorders, it has not been possible to completely separate normal and pathological symptom expressions contained in diagnostic criteria. Therefore, a generic diagnostic criterion requiring distress or disability has been used. So it's kind of like they're saying, you know, well, we wanted it to be dysfunction, but, you know, we don't really know how to do that. So we'll just use distress or disability as a marker for, for dysfunction in, instead. So uh, we mentioned Robert Spitzer before, the, the chairman task for DSM-3. So he kind of like, you know, uh, he was a big participant in the, in the homosexuality debate. And in one of his articles for American Journal of Psychiatry, he writes, in my judgment, the question of whether or not heterosexual functioning should be used as a norm so that inability to function heterosexually is impairment in a major area of functioning is a value judgment and not a factual matter the concept of disorder always involves a value judgment. So that's a kind of like, you know, he's sort of like coming out and saying very clearly that regardless of what else may be involved, it does, it necessarily, when we're talking about dysfunction, we are relying on value judgments in some way, even though we might be relying on other, other things as well. So that's kind of like, you know, that's one of the, that's, that's you know, the person behind DSM-3 coming out sort of like, you know, at least partially normative account of, of disorder. And then this is Alan Francis. He was the successor to Robert Spitzer. He was the chairman task for DSM-4. So I'm gonna read a, a passage from, from a very wonderful article uh, that he wrote in 2013 called uh, DSM in Philosophy Land. So he writes, alas, uh, I have read dozens of definitions of mental disorder and helped to write one, the, the DSM-4 definition. And I can't say that any have the slightest value, whatever. Historically, conditions have become mental disorders by accretion and practical necessity, not because they met some independent set of operationalized definitional criteria. Indeed, the concept of mental disorder is so amorphous, protein, and heterogeneous that it inherently defies definition. This is a hole at the center of class psychiatric classification. And the specific mental disorders certainly constitute a hodgepodge. If there is a common theme, it is distress and disability, but these are very imprecise and non-specific markers on which to hang a definition. Ironically, the one definition of mental disorder that does have great and abiding practical meaning is never given formal status because it is, it is tautological and potentially highly self-serving. It would go something like mental disorder is what clinicians treat and researchers research and educators teach and insurance companies pay for. In effect, this is historically how the individual mental disorders made their way into the system. So Alan Francis here is kind of like referring to this pragmatic idea of mental disorder, that what makes something a mental disorder is not really these abstract notions about dysfunction or abstract notions about sort of like harm. It's really sort of like what the psychiatric and medical community decides to do, what they decide to treat, what they decide to research, what the insurance companies decide to pay for. You know, it's, it's basically like the system defines what, uh, what, you know, mental disorder is going to be. He sort of like, he sees, he takes this uh, pragmatic approach and that's really quite something, you know, again, this is, this is not some, 
random critic, you know, on the internet, uh, or sort of like, or some 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 sort of anti psychiatrist. Like this is the guy who made DSM four, you know. So this is sort of like, I guess, as close to DSM royalty you can get. And this is this is quite an admission. Now I started with a with a. A quote by Bertrand Russell, and when Bertrand Russell was kind of like talking about the vagueness of concepts, uh, one of the things he was thinking about was physics. You know, he was trying to define some of the fundamental concepts in physics, and he comes up with a very interesting definition of matter. In um, uh, and he says, "My own definition of matter may seem unsatisfactory. I should define it as what satisfies the equations of physics." And again, sort of like this is a sort of like same sort of pragmatic approach that if instead of equations of physics, you have the practice of psychiatry, you know, and instead of matter, you have mental disorder, then mental disorder is what satisfies the equation, uh, satisfies the practice of, of psychiatry. But, you know, we can immediately sort of like sense that there's something wrong about it. There's something off about this way of thinking. And that, that was sort of like the opposing point of view was articulated by Robert Kendall, who said that the fact is that any definition of disease, which boils down to what people complain of or what doctors treat or some combination of the two is almost worse than no definition at all. It is free to expand or contract with changes in social attitudes and therapeutic optimism and is at the mercy of idiosyncratic decisions by doctors or patients. He says it's, it's sort of like, you know, it doesn't offer you any boundary at all because this, you know, it just the boundary can just like keep shifting, keep changing. So like, how does that, how does this, this sort of pragmatic view help us? So you can sort of like see the tension uh, between uh, sort of like the reasons for considering the pragmatic view as something, you know, that, uh, that is relevant, applicable versus uh, and accepting that versus sort of like these sorts of arguments for, for rejecting that. So let's take a, a quick look at sort of like the idea of biological dysfunction and sort of like whether biological abnormalities can, can settle this debate for us. And I think the starting point that, that I often kind of like an attitude that I often encounter is sort of like what I call crude biological causation. And it's, I, you can also sort of like call it like the dude argument because it's sort of like articulated in the manner of uh, depression is caused by genes, dude. Of course, it's a disease. Or, or depression is associated with functional MIR abnormalities, dude. Of course, it's a disease. It's kind of like it's sort of like this brute force argument that well, we have these biological changes that are associated with it. So of course, like that makes it that makes it a disease. The problem with sort of like with this is that this sort of like argument confuses causation and etiology with this notion of dysfunction because anything whether this is normal or abnormal is going to have causes anything that is normal or abnormal is going to have some kind of an etiology particularly if we reject mind brain dualism you know it doesn't sort of like this idea that oh if there are biological causes this means it's a disease it doesn't really tell us much because every psychological phenomena whether it's normal or abnormal has biological causes or at least biological correlates. You know, for biological causation to prove that a certain condition is the disorder, it's, it needs a discriminative account of like what sorts of causes biological, you know, what sorts of biological causes constitute a disorder. You can't just say that there are biological causes. You also need a discriminative account of what sort of causes or in the, in the language of like Dominic Murphy, the right sort of causal histories. You know, it, you can't just say that, you know, there, anything with a causal history, uh, you know, is a disease. You have to be able to give a discriminative account, like what sort of causal histories. So the, the challenge for, for this, this sort of thinking is to provide that discriminative account. Uh, another sort of like onion, uh, sort of like uh, headline, a UC Berkeley MRI brain scan study proves doing things uh, turns your brain yellow, red, and green. All right, so this point is sort of like, and I think it's articulated very well by, by Robert Spitzer in the discussion of homosexuality. So he writes, often in discussions of this kind, a hope is expressed that some biological abnormality, such as an endocrine or genetic disturbance, will be discovered and will resolve the issue once and for all. It is hard to see how this would answer the question any more than would knowledge of the biological cause or antecedents of left-handedness, surely there must be one, indicate whether that condition should be regarded as a normal variant or pathology. Like he's saying, you know, like obviously something is going to have biological causes, you know, like that by itself is really quite uninformative. And 
uh, Derek Bolton, he, he's a, a, a psychologist and a philosopher of psychiatry, makes a kind of a similar point in the context of functional neuroimaging. He says, by all means, it is the case that if we are assuming that a specific psychological condition is a disorder, then we may say in a derivative sense that the brain activity involved in producing it is disordered. But the inferential logic runs this way around, not the other. We do not see from the functional neuroimages that the brain activity or the areas involved in brain activity are disordered and then infer that the associated psychological functioning is a disorder. Like what he's saying is that in order for us to be able to do that, we need some kind of criteria for disorder. We need an, a notion of disorder that exists at the level of brain activity, that exists at the level of neuroscience. And currently we don't have that. The only sort of like notion of uh, disorder that we currently have is at the level of sort of like behaviors, at the level of psychological functioning. And it's only in as a sort of like indirect inference that we say that uh, the brain activity involved with something we have already identified at the psychological level as being disordered. So um, another sort of like, you know, the thing uh, in this in this context is that, you know, even though we may talk about sort of like notions of biological uh, dysfunction uh, or, or dysfunction in some other sense, you know, uh, our clinical practice doesn't really make much use of that. You know, and this I think is particularly evident when it comes to disorders such as other specified or not other specified disorders in the DSM. And what it means is that even when symptom presentations do not satisfy DSM threshold. So if someone let's say has just four depressive symptoms or they have had depression for just one week, you know, the accepted practice is still to label them as disorders. You'll call them depression and OS or unspecified depression. And what it shows is that when it comes to that overall judgment of disorder, the, the practicing psychiatrist is hardly concerned with the abstract question of sort of like, you know, is there some kind of like a has, has, some, has a brain malfunction in some way, even though that might be like an assumption in the mind, but that's not really playing the role here, you know? And so you can sort of like ask yourself the question, you know, so like when does like grief become a disorder or binge eating or low sexual desire or internet gaming, you know, a sort of like a harm-based answer, you know, sort of like a normative sort of answer would be that when it causes harm, when it causes distress and impairment versus sort of like a, a sort of like naturalistic dysfunction based answer might be that when it is the result of a malfunction in the brain, when it is a broken part or dysfunction, you know, and you can tell, you know, in your own clinical practice that even though we may think that, you know, we're operating in some naturalistic dysfunction based manner, but really our art sort of like, you know, these, uh, these boundaries when it comes to our clinical practice are being defined by considerations of harm, by considerations of distress and impairment. Most of the time, we don't even know if there is a malfunction or not. And if so, how can we sort of like, you know, identify that? So the clinical practice sort of like suggests that it's, you know, at the very least, the notion of disorder that exists in the practice is one that is inherently normative. And this is, uh, this is another onion cartoon, uh, uh, Chipotle meal doing all the heavy lifting in the sandwich. And so like my sort of like the analogy here is that if mental disorder is a sandwich, if sort of like, you know, clinical practice is a sandwich, then uh, these normative considerations are doing all the heavy lifting. You know, even though we may think that this function is doing the, the real heavy lifting, it's really not. It's, it's really these considerations of harm that are doing the heavy lifting in this sandwich of, uh, of psychiatry. Now, there are some naturalist theories. There are cert certain thinkers, two of them most prominent, uh, Christopher Boers and Jerome Wakefield, who have tried to provide naturalist accounts of dysfunction. They, they think that we can identify based on objective factual grounds um, you know, that something is something is a is a dysfunction. And so Christopher Bohr's takes a broadly biostatistical approach to that. Wakefield takes a broadly evolutionary approach to that. Um, I don't have time to sort of like go into those theories. So we'll sort of like defer at, at some point. But a point that I will make here is that whether we sort of like take a more bad statistical approach to that, or whether we take a dysfunctional sort of like evolutionary approach to that, those concepts are not the one that are driving our clinical practice. So if we are interested in, in, in our clinical practice and the notion of disorder as it exists in clinical practice, 
naturalist theories are not the one that that capture what that concept is. Obviously, the naturalists will argue that our clinical concepts should should change such that it conforms naturalism. But that's a separate debate. As it currently exists in clinical practice, uh, the notion is not one that is naturalist. So. So what happens if we accept this idea that this, bo this boundary between normal and abnormal, between normal and disorder is really being sort of like driven by these human interests and by these sort of like these complex value judgments, you know, what sort of picture emerges of, of psychiatry? So, you know, I, briefly, I'll kind of summarize, uh, summarize that. So, you know, from such a perspective, mental disorder sort of like you know when it is defined within the clinical phenomena and based on notions of harm it cannot be readily distinguished from social and personal norms you can't say that you know this sort of like is a very distinctly medical scientific concept that is clearly delineated from from uh, social and personal norms you know you won't be able to do that if 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 normative consideration, then medical norms are mixed in with social and personal norms. And then medical disorders are disorders because these are the problem. They, they, are, they are problems people historically have sought medical help for and which physicians have agreed warrant treatment. This kind of like refers to that sort of like pragmatic idea that Alan Francis was, was referring to that like these are basically problems that people bring to the clinic that they seek help for. Um, and it is sort of like those considerations. And, and the reason people seek help is because of these sort of like value laden considerations of something going wrong or some kind of like, you know, distress disability happening. Mental disorder understood in this way does not have much to do with abstract speculations of dysfunction. It is much more here and now involving values and judgments of harm and the need to treat it. The personal, social, and biological are hardly distinguishable. And decisions as to what conditions do or do not count as mental disorders are subject to influences from a variety of stakeholders, including people with the problems, carers, purchasers, providers, and the manufacturers of treatment technology. So you sort of like you end up in a situation where if there is no natural boundary, if there is no boundary that exists in terms of natural facts, then you're forced to sort of like negotiate this boundary between sort of like various stakeholders, between sort of like various players who have an interest in, in that. And this is this sort of negotiation between stakeholders is precisely what we have seen in res recent dec decades, beginning with the negotiation over, over homosexuality where the uh, where the LGBT community, where the gay community said, you know, we, we don't want sort of like to be pathologized. We don't think of ourselves as ill. We don't think of ourselves as disordered. And sort of like, you know, and that started this process of negotiation, which ultimately led to the declassification of homosexuality. And we are seeing these sorts of negotiations happening in the context of autism, in the context of gender dysphoria. And, and the idea is that, that there are no objective facts that we can rely on to say that this is the dividing line. In the absence of that dividing line, this negotiation between stakeholders is, is all we have. Now, for a lot of people, this might sort of like represent, you know, a, a very skeptical sort of conclusion. You know, they might sort of like feel very uncertain or threatened that this kind of like in some way threatens the legitimacy of psychiatry, threatens the scientific status of medicine generally. And to sort of like allay some of those fears and concerns, I want to end on something that that Derek Bolton wrote. Um, Derek Bolton is one of my one of my favorite commentators in, in the field of philosophy of psychiatry. And he has kind of like, you know, uh, delved in this uh, naturalism, normativism debate considerably. But you know, he, he comes out with sort of like, you know, on, on the other end, not with sort of like full blown skepticism, but what he calls skepticism of the gentle variety. So, so let me read what he, what he sort of like the conclusion, concluding place that he ends up at. He says, there ends up being, so far as I can see, no stable reality or concept of mental disorder. It breaks up into many quite different kinds, uh, some reminiscent of an old idea of madness or mental illness, others nothing like this at all. That said, the skepticism is just about whether there is something stable fixed and distinctive here for which mental disorder is a suitable name. It does not include doubts about the reality of the phenomena, the distress and disabilities that people bring to the clinic and the need for psychiatric care. 
the domain of healthcare as a response to personal distress and disability seems to me permanent, only mistakenly seen as something to be deconstructed away. There may be no clear basis for distinguishing between mental health problems and social problems or between mental health problems and normal, more or less normal problems of living. But what distinguishes healthcare is the response to the person involved. The response is care for the individual based on professional training, science and expertise, distinct from social or political action or religious judgment or demands for self-reliance. So what Derek Bolton is saying is that just because we don't have this objective natural boundary between uh, normal and disordered, doesn't mean that we have to sort of like give up this whole uh, enterprise of trying to make sense of the distress and disability that people bring to the clinic and trying to respond to that in a manner that sort of like builds on, uh, on ideas of science, that builds on professional training, that sort of like utilizes evidence space um, and regarding sort of like, you know, what works, what doesn't work, and utilizes scientific methods in investigations of, of causes. So he said it would be a mistake to think that just because we have no firm boundary between uh, mental disorder and social problems or problems in living, that we have to give up this whole project or declare that the whole project is, is unscientific uh, by itself. So so this this skepticism of the gentle variety is the is kind of like, you know, uh, is the note on on, on which I'll end this uh, presentation and uh, we can um, kind of open this up for uh, some questions and answer discussions. Uh, this is my email address uh, of sfthab at gmail.com. You know, if anyone wants to reach out to me, if anyone is looking for additional recommendations or has other kinds of thoughts or inquiries, you know, like my email is open. Um, you're, you're always very welcome to contact me and, and reach out to me. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen at, at this point. Dr. Aftab, thank you so much for, um, for an absolutely fascinating talk. Um, you, you, you carved a path through a, a very difficult and, and complex subject. Um, and, and I think that was incredibly insightful and, and, and you, you, um, yeah, you, you clarified a, a complex issue. So, so thank you so much. And um, I imagine there's, there's lots of questions. Um, I, I can't remember how we usually do this. Might I suggest that they're, they don't need to be written in the chat as such, but if you just put something in the chat so that um, your name will come up and then I'll, I'll work, through, um, work through the names in order, perhaps. I, so I, I yeah I think I think that strategy makes sense. I think you know someone people can indicate in the chat box that they have a question, but then they can say the question out loud. Um, you know, uh, uh, so like during this presentation. So I, I think uh, um, 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 one person has already sort of like put a, some some thoughts and uh, questions. So uh, Ian Smith, um, do, would you like to kind of like you know share what what where your what your thoughts are? Sure. Um, yeah, thanks so much. Um, I've, I've always been interested in nosology and, and remember as a medical student writing about the APA deciding homosexuality wasn't a mental disorder back in the back in the 70s. Around the same time, Kendall, who you quoted, argued it was in his inaugural address in Edinburgh because it, re, uh, because it uh, impaired reproductive success. So he got into big trouble with that. And um, the main thing I was thinking um, through your talk was, um, I was thinking back to Kraepelin and, you know, what may, when psychiatry was on surer ground thinking about insanity, you know, the core, before we expanded diagnosis into office practice, but the thing, I mean, Kraepelin would have said, I think that these are probably brain diseases, but we haven't a clue how to, investigate that. But the, ma the main thing he thought was, you know, this cluster of symptoms equals a bad prognosis, dementia precox, and this, this intermittent mood disorder um, equals a better prognosis in that you get the restitutio ad integrum, the, the, you know, the manic episode stops, there's a few years of normality, then they get depressed. So I, I, I suppose my question was, does you know, what, what you presented, I don't, I don't think intentionally, you know, you could see it as quite cross-sectional and most of our diagnoses have a time criteria to them and so on. 
But d d does that longer view, that kind of idea of a natural history to these disorders help us in any way? Um, may maybe to dismiss the things that are transient disorders? Sure, but, yeah. So no, I, I think that that's, that's a very valid point and I think important to address. So I think one, one when it comes to Preplin, you know, I think one thing we have to realize is that you know, so we, I talked about the two levels of classification, you know, is this condition within the class of mental disorders and how do we classify within the class itself? Kreplin, for the most part, has been concerned with a level two classification. You know, he, he sort of like accepts that there's this sort of like, you know, this broader idea of like, you know, mental insanity or, you know, madness, something that, you know, uh, you have sort of like, you have this category of insanity. And Kreplin was kind of like concerned about the project of like, how do we delineate conditions within this realm of insanity, sort of like, you know, how do we sort of like decide, sort of like, you know, how do we, how do we discriminate between conditions within that class? And, and he thought that an emphasis on natural history, the longitudinal course of action would help discriminate that, you know, but he didn't really think much about sort of like this larger category of insanity itself, you know, so if you were to ask Kreplin, well, you know, okay, so you say that there's this dementia precox and then there's this manic depressive insanity, but what really is insanity itself? I'm not sure if, if, if Kreplin would have had a well thought out response, uh, you know, to, to that particular question. And, 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 the, and the environment was very different as well, because, you know, the, the environment in which Kreplin was operating was one that was sort of like heavy on sort of like asylums where this notion of madness and insanity was had been removed from social conscious consciousness and had been kind of like separated from the social space into this sort of like these institutions that were designed for that category. So, you know, they were thinking when, when, when sort of like, you know, a lot of the German uh, sort of like psychopathologists of, of his age, when they were thinking about insanity, they were thinking about sort of like this group of individuals who had already been excluded from sort of like from individual society, from regular society, and had been sort of like, you know, put into this separate category. So it was, you know, it was that category was almost a given for them. You know, they didn't really spend a lot of time thinking as to like, you know, like why are we sort of like, you know, what is this separate group that we're doing? And when they did think about that, they would sort of like rely on sort of like notions of like degeneracy that sort of like, you know, these are people who sort of like, you know, uh, are degenerate in some way and they need to be separated from the, like the pool of like, you know, non-degenerates. So sort of like, you know, but those were sort of like background assumptions that were kind of playing a part in sort of like how society thought about these conditions. So my sort of like response would be that, you know, my feeling is that Kreplin and most, you know, most psychiatrists of his, of his age sort of accepted the societal notion of insanity and they were interested in classifying insanity from within as to sort of like separating sort of like how do we make sense of insanity but they weren't really that interested in this broader question of what insanity is implicitly relying on society to do that do that job for them and this problem has become much much more acute now that the sort of like the asylums have sort of the walls of the asylum have come down and the mental disorder is now in the community itself. And we can sort of like see that those physical, the, those uh, physical as well as social separations don't hold anymore. So we are having to confront mental illness as something that exists within us, something that exists within ordinary individuals. And that boundary for that reason becomes much, much more problematic. No, thanks. I, I think my only counter to that would be schizophrenia and bipolar are still with us 100 and 30 years later as concepts. So they, they obviously had some utility that, has, that hasn't been taken away. Anyway. No, no, I, I agree. And I think the, the challenge I think is that, you know, we're not thinking of specific conditions. We're, talk, we're thinking of the overarching category. Now, sort of like, you know, disorders, you know, it also includes things like, like organic disorders, things like Alzheimer's, you know? So, so when we talk about the overarching category as being determined by value laden, it doesn't mean that all specific, you know, all conditions that fall within that category, like have no biological basis or have no demonstrable pathology. The, the challenge is in sort of like, you know, is that how do we make sense of that overarching category? And you could very well say that there is no coherent overarching category by itself. You could, for example, say that it, it's a mistake to think that one single concept can cover 
conditions from Alzheimer to raging to adjustment disorder. It's like you could say that, you know, that's, an, that's a, a philosophically unviable task and we should just give it up. You know, in which case we were, we're just sort of like fragmenting the notion of mental disorder into several different kinds. But as long as this notion exists, and as long as it ranges from things like Alzheimer's to adjustment disorder, you know, we have to sort of like think about a definition that applies to all of them, not just to specific conditions. Thank you. Um, Mark, do you want to um, just uh, speak a little bit about what, you, what your question was? Um, so, um, well, it's, thanks very much. I really enjoyed that. Um, but I suppose it, for me, it just it raised the question, which is in just in, in my comment there. Why, why do you think, basically, on the, along the lines of the social world being terribly important in terms of how we think about mental disorders, why so little emphasis in the social world in terms of psychiatric education? Do you think? Um, I, I think there are, there, are, uh, um, uh, there are a lot of sort of like reasons for that. And I think some, some of them have to sort of like do with various sorts of um, shift, historical shifts that, that have happened in, in psychiatry. I think if we go back to the, to the, um, to the 60s and in the, in the 70s, you know, especially in, in the US, I think there was a big emphasis on, on the social world. I mean, we, we had a lot of uh, what you would sort of like call in retrospect, like social psychiatrists or people who were, like, who were interested in, in, in sort of like social conditions, the way sort of like the, uh, the individual conditions sort of like you know, emerge uh, in relationship to sort of like social conditions. So there was kind of an emphasis back then, but I think over the decades kind of like, you know, the, the pendulum kind of shifted in favor of a much more sort of like biological approach and the kind of like the sentiment became that we have to identify uh, sort of like specific dysfunctions, we have to identify abnormalities in the individual brain, that that's where we're going to find the solutions. And I think this particularly happened at a sort of like broader cultural level as well with the in the 90s with the decade of the brain. So when sort of like this, the idea of the decade of the brain emerged, there, there was a sort of like universal enthusiasm that, you know, sort of like brain sciences are going to provide us with answers, like not just to mental illness, but for even for like, you know, all sorts of other kind of like problems. So, so I sort of like see this as a sort of like cultural as well as sort of like uh, medical kind of enthusiasm that sort of like gen was generated around the decade of the brain and that that has now lasted almost almost three decades now and that emphasis i think led to kind of like ignoring and sort of like excluding uh, a lot of the social that that exists within within psychiatry the good thing though is that things are changing in that regard too i, I mean it's sort of like the this is partly related to the topic of my uh, sort of like, you know, uh, talk because, you know, once we sort of like recognize the boundaries of health and disease are like influenced, determined by human interest, and then obviously it makes sense that, you know, so society, social values are a stakeholder in that. But even from like, a, uh, like you know, e even setting aside the question of sort of like, you know, concepts itself, even if you're looking at like causes mental illness, you know, from, from that standpoint, the social risk factors uh, are, are beginning to sort of like receive a lot of attention. Um, in, in the US, there's sort of like, there's a lot of talk of structural competency and structural determinants of health. So people are sort of like, you know, taking, beginning to take a public health approach to these issues. And they're talking about uh, sort of like, you know, uh, social adversity, social conditions, things like that. So I'm, I'm hopeful that, the, that, the, trend is, that tr the trend is beginning to change. And that we we are sort of like beginning to kind of re reincorporate uh, the emphasis on the social that that we had lost uh, before. So um, there's 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 no more questions on the chat at the moment. Um, so just I mean I'd, I'd certainly encourage people to please um, you know do do post um, but in the meantime um. Oh, here we go. Um, yeah, do, do you want to do you want to verbalize um, that just for the recording? I'm not sure whether I'm able to formulate my question well, but thank you for that uh, fascinating presentation. Um, I currently work in CAMS, and I suppose where I am, sometimes you actually 
see, you know, the, the boundaries being quite blurred and we do work quite closely with social work school and normal and disorder, you know, we try to try and define that. Um, I mean, I, I, I'm trying to kind of understand, for example, uh, a disease like ADHD, where it's very much a spectrum, you know, is it that the prevalence of certain diseases across the world is going to be quite different? Is it because of how society recognizes that? And, you know, I don't know what your thoughts are, you know, on kind of things like preventative work in, you know, and raising the awareness in the community, would that actually create more definitions of diseases or more makes makes it more prevalent or I, I, I I'm not sure whether you understand what I'm trying to get at but I'm, I'm just wondering you know going into yeah. the future is this no no I, I think I think you're I think you're bringing in one point I, I think you know for, from my point of view what this debate and what this discussion does is that we need much more clarity on what exactly we are doing when we make these distinctions. So, so, you know, when we sort of like, when we decide that, you know, like, like, you know, here on the spectrum, let, let's say you have these traits, like, you know, ADHD traits, you have a, a, a sort of like, a, you know, inattention and sort of like concentration impairment. And obviously it's like, you know, some people have a lot of it and some people have like, you know, very little of it. And so, you know, we decide that, you know, like this is the level where we are gonna say that, you know, this degree of inattention and this degree of concentration impairment is a disorder and anything below that is, is not like what what are we hoping to achieve by that you know like what is the what is the task or the purpose of that distinction let me sort of like make an analogy with, with sort of like general medicine so think of a condition like essential hypertension high blood pressure you know like the blood pressure sort of like you know exists on a spectrum you know sort of like it's it's a it's a dimensional trait you know like some people have low blood pressure some people have high blood pressure there is no natural dividing line that you know like at this blood pressure you know like some kind of a disorder begins and at this blood pressure doesn't so you know so the 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 can sort of like the conventional cutoff mark that we use like you know 140 by 80 millimeters of mercury it's not something that exists out there in nature. Like, you know, we decided arbitrarily that we're going to draw that line. And why did we do that? Because we sort of like realized that people who, ha who have a blood pressure higher than that value, they tend to be at higher risk of events such as stroke, heart disease, you know, all sorts of other consequences. So we thought, well, okay, so if our goal is to prevent these adverse effects from happening, then what is the cutoff that makes more sense? And the, the conventional cutoff that made more sense was 140. And then they realize and they look, oh, you know, if we actually look at individuals with diabetes, you know, it seems like even people who have 130 by 80, you know, some they, have, they can have higher risks. So let's sort of like move the boundary that, you know, at 130, we'll say that this is a disorder and below that, no. So you can see sort of like, you know, you know we are forced to think about like what it is that our distinction is doing. And in the case of hypertension, the distinction is meant to identify risk of future cardiovascular and cerebral events. So, you know, so when it comes to a condition like ADHD, we have to ask ourselves, you know, like what are we trying to do when we, when we say that for a diagnosis of ADHD, it has to meet such and such symptoms. Now, uh, like one, one potential answer to that might be, you know, well, we wanna identify who will respond to stimulants and who wouldn't. So, you know, so one purpose of the category of the dividing line could be trying to determine response to treatment versus a genetic researcher might say, well, my interest is that I, I want to sort of like draw a boundary where we can identify genetic variants of interest to us, you know, or another sort of like person might say that I want to draw the boundaries where I can identify like brain changes. You know, I'm, I'm sort of like, you know, uh, presenting different hypothetical ways. So what I'm saying is that, where we draw the boundary and in what context is going to determine on what our goals are. And so what this, what, and a lot of times those goals are sort of like, you know, very human sort of like concerns. We want to prevent harm. We want to prevent disability. We want to relieve uh, impairment. So what this does is that it forces us to be, to sort of like be mindful of 
where we are drawing these boundaries and why. And if we can sort of like have more clarity over what the goals are, then we can better resolve these debates versus if we just keep thinking that, oh, there's some entity out there, ADHD, and it has, it, it has natural boundaries. And, and our goal is to, to discover what those natural boundaries are. Then we are going to sort of like, that's kind of like, a, you know, that's a very different sort of pursuit than saying that, you know, it's a dimensional thing. There are no natural boundaries and the boundaries will be determined by our goals. So let us gain clarity of what we're trying to do. I guess, I guess for things like ADHD, you know, it might be, it might be that, you know, you're trying to prevent, let's say, criminality and stuff like that, or you're trying to make sure that they get into jobs. And I suppose even things like that for, for people are so multifactorial. It depends on, you know, the friends that you've met or the, the, the teacher that you've had or the school that you've, you know, so it's as much as, yes, I see, I see what you're saying, and I think it does make sense. I think for psychiatry, for mental health, there's so much more multifactorial kind of things that come in play that affects. And I guess if you think about different parts of the world where maybe certain ADHD traits are actually desirable and that's what you need, then that is actually considered less of a disease compared to another place where you actually need to sit down and learn in a classroom. So it's it's quite an interesting and thought provoking. Right, exactly. I mean, sort of like, like ADHD becomes sort of like distressing and impairing in the modern uh, sort of like educational setting, which is sort of like places a great emphasis on structure, discipline, ability of kids to like sit down and do their, pay attention to their work for extended periods. If you have a very different sort of societal structure, you know, you have a tribal system, you know, in Africa or in other sort of like countries where there isn't that, where that expectation doesn't exist, then you're not going to sort of like see that same sort of distress and impairment emerge in the educational setting. So in resultantly, you know, the boundary would be very different in a, in a slide like that. So this also sort of like stresses that the idea that there could be universal boundaries that apply like, you know, to all cultures, to all settings is likely a false idea to the extent that these boundaries are determined by our pragmatic goals, these goals are going, you know, these boundaries would change as our pragmatic goals change. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks very much. Um, as you just perfectly demonstrated there, um, Dr. Aftab, I think it can be helpful when, when we're thinking about these, these issues within psychiatry to, to kind of compare and contrast to uh, physical uh, health problems and um, I was just wondering what your views were on whether the the normative versus naturalism debate and the issues that that arise within discussing mental illnesses uh, are these kind of problems equally applicable to um to medicine more generally um, or is it that actually, you know, that it's just as value, or, you know, is it just as value based? It's just that we generally are more universally in agreement on what those values are. Or is there something more objective in, in defining these kinds of dysfunctions compared to, to other kinds of dysfunctions? And I suppose that's particularly within the context of the movements, the kind of neurodiversity movement and the the kind of some right. of the disability movements. No, the, the, these questions, like fundamentally, like this this debate fundamentally is not just about psychiatry, but uh, but of all of medicine. So when we talk about the boundaries of disorder, you know, we're not just interested in sort of like mental disorders only. We're interested in all disorders, which which also include medical disorders. Um, you know, the thing I think you highlighted sort of like the the difference comes is that the uh, sort of like the there's much more disagreement when it comes to psychiatry, because we're sort of like, you know, dealing with sort of like our sense of self, we're dealing with sort of like our behavior, we're sort of like dealing with social control, things like that. So for, for a variety of reasons, when it comes to psychiatric conditions, where to draw the boundaries sort of like becomes much, much more contentious, and we are less likely to find universal agreement. Versus in, in many conditions in, in, in medicine, there tends to be a general sort of like background disagreement regarding sort of like, you know, that this condition is, you know, um, is sort of like really harmful, really impairing that, you know, there's, there isn't even this question of like, you know, whether we're going to sort of like, you know, challenge, uh, you know, uh, 
the, the, the disorder status or disease status to that. But uh, when it does happen, when it's sort of like, you know, when, when, the, when there is disagreement over values, we do see the same debates play out in, in sort of like in the rest of medicine as well. So we are seeing this in the context of obesity. We're sort of like seeing this sort of like, you know, where to sort of like draw the line when it comes to like weight, because that's a much more sort of like, you know, socially contentious issue. We are seeing this in the context of aging, you know, sort of like at, at what point do we say that this is just normal aging? And at what point do we just say that this is kind of like, you know, abnormal aging, you know, like everyone ages and dies, you know, that's sort of like a universal process. So at what point do we draw the line that aging is going to be normal and aging is going to be abnormal, you know, like that there, there is sort of like, you know, relative disagreement on, on those things. Um, and so infertility, I guess, would be another example where, you know, uh, where sort of like social values play, play a role. So you, you, you mentioned sort of like the um, neurodiversity movement. And I think neurodiversity movement sort of like makes this distinction and sort of like, you know, neurodiversity bring these background values to the forefront in a very dramatic manner. And it does so regardless of etiology. So for example, you know, the neuro, neurodiversity, neurodisability movement would say that, some, they would say that, you know, we need to think about conditions such as Down syndrome, you know, like, so like no one is disputing that Down syndrome is caused by genetic mutation. Like you have a very clear cut, uh, you know, genetic etiology for that. But from the neurodiversity perspective, they would say, like, why are we calling this a disease? Why not a sort of like a different way of existing? You know, and so they, you know, uh, proponents of neurodiversity force us to sort of like think about the values that are often hidden just because sort of like, you know, they, they have been sort of like, they have gone by uncontested, you know? So, and I think the example of Down syndrome and neurodiversity shows that this really is not a problem about the biological etiology, etiology. It's not like we would solve this problem in psychiatry by finding biological etiologies for all. It shows that even if we had sort of like, you know, uh, clear cut biological causes, we would still have to tackle the question of values and sort of like, you know, how to define these, these, these concepts and where to draw the boundary. Thank you very much. Um, I think we've got some more comments. Uh, I'm aware we're just coming up to half past eight um, our time. Um, Mark and Ian, do you, do you want to um, do you want to comment? Um, oh, put my camera on. Yeah. Sorry, I was I was just having some fun quoting Ardy Lane that uh, life's a genetic disorder with 100% mortality, but he was. He was trying to debunk genetics of schizophrenia at the time. I, I, I was interested at the start, we heard you work in addictions as well, Dr. After, but I mean, the, 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 I, I went to America many years ago and uh, discovered the disease concept of addiction was a big thing in America. Whereas in this country, we, we wouldn't put the emphasis on this as a disease and see it more as a problem behavior. So, you know, even, even in English speaking countries, you get big diversion, a big divergence and how, how common, I mean, if, if alcoholism is the most common mental disorder over the life course, very, you know, Nora Volkov versus Carol Hart in America give you very different versions mm -hmm. of what that's all about, you know. So anyway, that, I, I thought this was a great evening. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you for the comment. Appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. Does anybody have a final question or will we leave it there? Okay. Well, Dr. Aftab, thank you so much. Um, we're, we're at the same number of participants that we started with, which I think is um, is a testament to yourself. So, um, yeah, I mean, I mean, thank you on on behalf of of everyone. It's absolutely fascinating talk and, and much appreciated. No, yeah, thank you for your interest and for your engagement. And I mean, these are obviously like very tricky and complex issues. So. Uh, like I would encourage you like not to like take my answers for granted, but kind of like think about them and try to like come up with answers of your own. All right. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>